Welcome everybody to this year's Cordon Oration. Um, I think I, I do know most of you, I had the pleasure of meeting most of you, but if not, I'm Scott Charles. I'm the Deputy Warden at Trinity College. Um, and at Trinity, we have a genuine desire to um, improve and progress the wellbeing of our first Australians. Um, and indeed a genuine desire to actually understand um, their culture and stories and to learn from those. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the, the Wurundjeri people from the lands where I'm coming to from you this, mo this morning in Hawthorne, but also all of the elders um, from the lands where you're coming from and indeed welcome any, any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that we have with us in the audience this morning. So welcome, thank you for joining us. Uh, a few special welcomes this morning. I'd like to um, firstly welcome our football royalty in the Cordner family. We have a, a great group of um, the Cordner family joining us again today, so welcome. Um, I'd also like to welcome the Vice Chancellor, Professor Dunk Duncan Maskell and his wife, Sarah, and also the Warden of Trinity College, Professor Ken Hinchcliffe and his wife, Carol, are joining us today. So. But you're all very special. So welcome to all of you as well. Um, we, uh, the order of proceedings today, the format is if I, after I've spoken, I'm going to introduce uh, Chris, Chris Cordner, who will speak on behalf of the family, but he'll also introduce our speakers today, Kate and Mike Sheehan. So um, clearly very, very, very happy to have Kate and Mike with us today in a sort of a reverse open mic where Kate will be interviewing Mike. So Chris will introduce those, those two. They'll speak for about half an hour, then we'll have questions. And what I'll do just before we get to questions is we'll do them with a the format of actually sending me a chat function. So if you can just send me the chat and then to say you'd like to ask a question and then I'll be able to say, oh, Jane Fremantle has a question or David Berry has a question or Genevieve Bramel has a question. I'll just introduce you like that and then you'll unmute and come on like that. So I think we'll kick it off. I think we will, um, Welcome to the Zoom stage, please. Um, Chris Cordner. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, um, closing my eyes and not having to look at your Richmond, uh, <laughs> your, 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 your um, get up, but I won't close my eyes. My sight's not good enough for that to be a serious problem anyway now, but I'd, I'd like to begin by thanking you um, and Matilda and Viv for organising this event uh, yet again and for doing it so so efficiently and so uh, thoughtfully and, and, and carefully. And I'd also like to thank uh, Ken Hinchcliffe, uh, Warden of Trinity, and, and the college for um, their hosting of this annual event and just to, um, on behalf of our family to express our gratitude to the, the college for uh, doing that. Football is a, a great game. That's a, a, a cliche and, and, and a truth that nobody who's here this morning needs reminding of, or you wouldn't be uh, here. <clears throat> but it's also part of the fabric of Melbourne life and of wider Victorian and Australian life. And one reason why it's such a pleasure to have Mike and Kate here with us uh, this morning is because uh, Mike has been bettered by no one as an explorer and celebrator of the human dimensions of the game of football. And I'll come back to that um, uh, in, a, in a moment, so a little bit more about that. But first, I just want to give a, a very brief thumbnail sketch of Michael's, of Mike's very long uh, um, uh, CV as a, as a sporting journalist in Melbourne. I think I've managed to eliminate most of Wikipedia's errors on, on this front, uh, but if I get anything else seriously wrong, Mike can correct me in due course. He began his, his life as a sporting journalist with a publication called Newsday that I'd even forgotten about and most of you probably never have heard of, which had a, a very uh, short-lived uh, being in Melbourne. Um, Mike was there in 1969 uh, initially. Uh, he moved to the age in 1973 um, and was there for uh, six years. He replaced Alf Brown as the uh, chief football writer there for that period. 
He then spent five years or so as the media director of the AFL. He then spent, had a stint of three years at the Sunday Age from 1989 to 1982, uh, 1992, and then he had 18 years uh, as the chief football writer at the Herald Sun. He finished up there in 2011, uh, then <clears throat> worked on radio, on the ABC and 3AW, uh, on television, channels seven and nine. He was a panelist in uh, on, on the Couch, <clears throat> Fox Sports, uh, and then from 2009 to 2020, he hosted Open Mic, um, which I'll say a little bit more about uh, in a moment. That just, just about covers the field of uh, uh, Melbourne uh, news and sports media. We couldn't have anybody better qualified to be speaking to us today uh, than Mike. He also has uh, his own, although he didn't play at AFL level, he ha has his own quite significant football pedigree, which I should also uh, mention here. He played 63 games for Werribee, not 55, as it says on Wikipedia. Uh, and he then played for North Hobart down in the Tasmanian Football League and very judiciously selected um, uh, a club that wore the Demons colours. <coughs> um, he is a Melbourne supporter himself. That's not a, um, uh, a prerequisite for being a, a speaker at this function. We've had passionate supporters of many other uh, uh, clubs, but I think uh, given what's about to happen in, in uh, nine days' time, it's particularly fitting that we should have a, a Demon supporter uh, speaking to us today. Mike hid that, hid that for many years actually, um, was a bit of a surprise to many of us to find out that he was a Melbourne um, uh, supporter. He, he thought this was a requirement of proper professionalism uh, in his field, but he's, he's able to uh, shout it from the rooftops now that he's uh, no longer gainfully employed in that sphere. Um, he became a Melbourne supporter in, in I guess, what's the, the most uh, uh, standard of ways to do so, because he, namely because he came from a, a passionate um, Demons family. Uh, and interestingly, his mother, he says, was even more passionate about the Demons than his father, and thereby hangs a, quite an important moment in Mike's uh, life education. As well as uh, uh, being passionate football supporters of the Melbourne Football Club, Mike's family were also um, uh, practicing and pretty devout and regular church going Catholics. Um, and Mike vividly remembers the first time um, that he saw those two big themes of his everyday life, football and religion, <clears throat> uh, directly intertwined. He was idly flipping through his mother's missal or prayer book <clears throat> uh, one day when the bookmark fell out. Um, was it a mild pastel shaded drawing of Jesus or the Blessed Virgin Mary? No, <laughs> no it was not. It was... Uh, uh, a footy card with a brightly coloured photo <coughs> of Jack Mueller uh, on it. Jack Mueller, demon legend, hero of the 1948 grand final, Ruckman and forward pocket in the team of the century. And Mike confesses to finding this uh, uh, abrupt and unexpected contact between the secular and the sacred uh, something of a shock uh, at, at the time. Uh, Look, that's, that's Mike's demons credentials um, uh, pretty well established, um, I think. But it needs to be, um, balance needs to be struck here. Um, Mike's a very fair and decent guy. So it, it's interesting and entirely fitting that Mike also has a, a strong sympathy for the Bulldogs. Just one quick um, uh, uh, partial explanation of, of that sympathy. Bernie Lee played 95 games with the Bulldogs between 1957 and 1963, mostly at fullback. Bernie Lee was 10 years older than Mike and lived round the corner from the Sheehan family in Werribee and actually uh, worked in the, the Sheehan family shop. He was understandably a hero of the, uh, the young boy, Mike, who used to polish, not only polish Bernie's boots, but carried his football bag. To Bulldogs games most Saturdays for many years, including to the 1961 grand final where Bernie played <coughs> at fullback. 
So uh, uh, Bernie's got a soft spot for the Bulldogs, and I must say, so have I. Um, and if there's one team I would, I won't say be happy to lose to, but be least distressed about losing to uh, next week, it would be it would be the Bulldogs. But that's not any kind of opening any kind of even small door to that possibility in my mind. Um, back to, to open mic for a moment. Uh, I think a lot of you would, would share my view that um, open mic was, I think anyway, Mike's greatest single contribution um, to football as a, uh, and to, to the place of football in, in wider uh, Melbourne and Australian life. <clears throat> Um, in his in his career as a, a sporting journalist, with scrupulous and detailed preparation, uh, and with flair, tact, and generosity in equal measure, Mike explored and celebrated the human dimensions of the footballing lives of so many of uh, the the greatest names in our in our code. His interviews opened up not only the person he was interviewing, but also football itself um, to the, the, the great benefit of, of, of all of us. Um, uh, and for that reason, we're, we're particularly happy to have um, Mike here today. Um, in turn, to be opened up, um, we expect by Kate's questions to him uh, in a moment, but not quite yet. I've just got um, a couple more important things to say because this is after all a double act it's not just Mike Sheehan it's also Kate Sheehan and Kate has as many of you uh, will already know her own <coughs> significant profile in the uh, the world of sport and sports related activities <coughs> she was a very talented uh, young tennis player who then became a, a tennis coach and I understand that um, uh, one of her most recent um, um, uh, deeds in that sphere was helping Dasha Gabrilova get back uh, from a, a serious knee injury onto the, onto the court. Kate also played uh, junior football, um, having to stop um, at the age of 13, as all girls did at, at, at that time. Um, she resumed she was the only girl, I believe, in, in, a, in a boys' competition. Um, she resumed playing football at Melbourne University some years later, um, where I think she um, uh, broke her arm at one point, which got in the way of the tennis uh, for, for a bit and led her to um, uh, be a bit more judicious in uh, <coughs> her subsequent um, football playing until she joined Collingwood in the first year of the AFLW uh, competition. Um, there she had the unfortunate experience of rupturing her ACL in her very first game uh, for Collingwood and so didn't uh, play again after that. In May 2017, Kate was appointed Football Operations Manager with the Richmond AFLW <coughs> program, um, position she, um, she still occupies. We have an extra reason to be um, pleased about uh, having that position because uh, our daughter Harriet now plays for Richmond and she and Kate have become um, uh, good friends um, since, since, um, since Harriet joined the club. So we're, we're delighted, Kate, to have you <clears throat> um, and to welcome you here today along with, uh, along with Mike and to... Um, uh, to uh, have you play your part in this <coughs> family team effort um, with Mike. Nearly there, <coughs> just one more uh, thing that I can't forbear mentioning. You will all know that Melbourne and, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, Melbourne and the Bulldogs have played in one previous grand final. That was 1954, another 10 years earlier than the 57 years since we won our last flag. Um, the Bulldogs won that encounter by exactly doubling Melbourne's score, 102 to, to 51. I went online just to have a, a, a quick look at um, what happened in that game and read Percy Beam's match report in The Age on Monday the 27th of September, two days after the, the game. And after his detailed description of the, the game, 
uh, Percy identifies what he calls the two stars of the game. And one of them was uh, John Kerr, the Bulldogs rover, and the other star he identifies was Dennis Cordner, um, one of my uncles, of course. And in the, the, the much soberer prose of the time than uh, is now um, uh, perhaps more common in, in football writing, um, Percy said this about, about Dennis. It was his safe marking, amongst other things, it was his safe marking and determined ruck play that allowed Melbourne to stage a kind of revival in the second quarter. Not a revival that took them very far, but um, uh, he must have played okay. Let's hope that a second quarter revival isn't needed uh, in nine days' time uh, against the, the Bulldogs, but um, uh, perhaps the, the modern day Dennis in the form of Max will, uh, will loom out of the... Uh, uh, loom out of the pack to, to uh, help us get back in the game if, if that is needed. Well, that, that's enough from, from me. Um, it's my great pleasure now to hand over to uh, Mike Sheehan and to Kate Sheehan um, to speak to us today, this time with, with uh, Mike um, not asking the questions but um, responding to those questions that are put to him by Kate. So thank you, Mike, and thank you, Kate. Over to you. Thanks, Chris, uh, for the warm invitation to Kate and me to participate in a coordinate oration. I must say your timing's impeccable too. I would say that uh, Smith, Barassi and Cordner are the most revered names in Melbourne's history, notwithstanding my unabashed love for Robbie Flower. Sadly, the only coordinates I've seen play are David and Harriet, uh, but I know very well the rich history that uh, the coordinates have got at Melbourne. After all my years of asking questions, I've decided to lay myself open to the questions of someone else. Given that Mark Jackson is under strict psychiatric care, or should be, I've turned to the person who knows me best, the head of women's football at Richmond and my baby girl, Kate. Now, Kate, I've just got one instruction to you. Don't bite the hand that feeds you, all right? <laughs> Hey, this is a pretty big forum, so I better not stuff it up. And I think Chris has already stolen some of my lines, so maybe we should have spoken before this, Chris. <laughs> Get on with it, Kate. Um, so firstly, I'd just like to thank everyone for the opportunity to even be a part of this. It's pretty special. Uh, it's more special having the opportunity to interview my dad, uh, someone I, I admire greatly, and um, I'm really really honoured and privileged that such a, um, an amazing organisation like Melbourne University and Trinity in particular have asked him to be a part of this. So, so thank you on behalf of the Sheehan family. Um, Dad, as you, can, as you can all see, Dad's a Melbourne supporter. Um, you've got four children. How many of them barrack for Melbourne? None. I, I don't know if I was, uh, something happened uh, at their birth and I think, um, at one point, when the four of them were on the planet together, I decided that we shouldn't all be unhappy at the same time. So I gave them all different teams so that someone would have some joy out of a round of football. And Kate was the lucky one. Uh, one of them drew North Melbourne. Uh, Kate drew Hawthorne. Uh, but none of them were delegated Melbourne. Yeah, I can't, I can't figure it out myself. He just makes life hard for himself. Um, <laughs> Chris, you mentioned the story about Bernie Lee and I, I wanted to go there because I feel like it's really fitting, um, particularly in this grand final two weeks where Melbourne are playing the Western Bulldogs. Dad, as you mentioned, had this um, terrific relationship with Bernie Lee and you told the story of the grand final where he actually um, carried his bags. Dad, I'd actually like you to tell everyone the real story. You, you couldn't quite carry his bags. Uh, grand final day. Grand final day. Tell us what happened. <laughs> grand final day. I'm um, 14 years of age. I'd broken my leg at footy training two weeks earlier, had a leg in plaster from my toe and up until uh, the top of my thigh. And I went with Bernie to the football from Werribee to the MCG. And Bernie Lee and Bob Spargo, both of whom were playing in the grand final that day, carried me up. To the, up the stairs to my seat in the northern stand before the game. And you imagine for a 14-year-old with two blokes playing in the grand final, carrying me up there. That was, I think it was worth having the broken leg, actually. I was really <laughs> proud of it. <laughs> so you can see at times how people get swayed between their clubs. And um, I think Dad's always done a great job of, of 
protecting who he barracks for and, and therefore his integrity. Let's um, let's go now towards your career. You had, as Chris mentioned, just such an illustrious career over so many different media forums. Tell us about over those, the radio, the TV and the print, which was the biggest story? Um, well, it would probably the story involved uh, Melbourne and Calvin Templeton and Peter Moore at the end of 1982. And I wrote the story that said that Calvin Templeton and Peter Moore were for sale for a million dollars. Now we think that's 40 years ago, a million dollars. Both of them were captains of their footy team and both were Brownlow medalists. And I had that story in form for three weeks and just couldn't believe that it would possibly be true. But then I was convinced by the people I was talking to that it was right. And the Herald ran the story on the front page and um, uh, to much to my relief, the story uh, eventuated and both of them ended up at Melbourne in 1983. So that, I think in, in terms of impact, that was probably the biggest. Yeah. We, uh, when I was putting a few questions together um, over the last couple of days, a, a topic that comes up quite frequently is the modern day journalism yep. as opposed to the era that you played in, you might say. Um, do, how do you think you would handle the current way that, that the footy journos and the sports journos have to go about it with the impact of social media yeah. and the urgency with which you need to get stories out? Now, that would trouble me. I must say, I'm not... Um, people of my vintage don't seem to be too proficient at uh, handling social media. Uh, I love the fact that when I worked at the papers that we had a deadline, we knew the deadline, um, things just unfolded from there. But now, as soon as they hear a whiff of a story, it's up on social media. This is not designed for me to say that we were better in our day or that they're better now or whatever, but I think that it's just it's changed so much. I think we dealt more in in actualities rather than opinion and, and, and whispers sometimes. I mean, Twitter seems to generate so much of, of the, the news feed these days and it opens itself up to sort of missing, misinterpretation and, and I think people going with things that are only half-baked, which is a worry, but oh, that's not to say that they're not very good at what they do. Yeah. How long back in the day? So you worked at the Daily Paper... Um, at the Herald, yep. and then uh, you went to the AFL, and then you went back to the Sunday Age, yep. which was a, a, a publication that only came out on a Sunday. How long would a big story hold for? Well, it depends. Some, I mean, the, the Moore and Templeton story held for three weeks. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they're that big that just people don't anticipate that they could possibly be true. And it depends how good your contacts are. But I, I love the Sunday Age, even though it was only a weekly cycle. I thought that raised sports journalism to another level in this town. There was a sports editor by the name of Jeff Slattery, who a lot of you will know, had restaurants, he's a publisher, was worked in newspapers, and he just demanded quality and depth and, and to cover all your bases. And I think the Sunday Age was the paper of its time, no doubt in my mind. Um, I'm pleased you bring up Jeff Slattery because he was, he is and was a, um, a really important mentor in your career. Yep. Tell the crew about the biggest thing and the biggest impact he had on your career whilst at the Sunday Age in the form of the top 50. Oh, that's right. Well, Slattery was, the, the, I mean, every time there's a someone talk, Chris, you didn't do it. You're the first person not to do it in 30 years, I reckon. Every time I'm being introduced, people talk about the top 50. And I think, I think it's flattering, but I'm not sure because it's not all that creative. It's just one person's opinion about who the best footballers in the competition are. But... It was a Jeff Slattery idea in 1990 or 91, I forget which, at the Sunday Age. And he came, he used to sit opposite me and he said, uh, I've got a job for you. He said, I want you to pick the best. No, I want you to name the best player in the competition. And I like that sort of stuff in one off. And I said, yeah, I'm happy to do that. And he said, I want you to put 49 behind him in order. And I said, you're kidding, aren't you? And anyway, so we wrestled with that um, and I did it. Uh, and Stephen Kernahan was the first number one. Full colour photo of him on the front page of the Sunday Age. He is the number one football in the competition. And I think that was the birth of the genre of people sort of having their top 10s and their top 20s and their top 50s. And it's still going. When I finished at the, uh, the Herald Sun, I left it behind, obviously. And Mark Robinson became the chief football writer and is still doing it today. Speaking of the 50, and I, I may get this wrong, but I feel like I definitely heard this. 
is it true that players would bring their ranking in the top 50 up in contract negotiations at clubs? Only if they were higher than they should have been. Um, I, I think, no, I, I'd heard that, but I mean, I wasn't party to those negotiations. But I suspect if anyone says, if anyone in a reputable publication says you are number five in the competition, it probably strengthens your case when you're going and doing your contract uh, renegotiations. I would have thought so, yeah. yeah. Um, so you worked across those those various forums, the print, the, yeah. the radio. Of all of them, which gave you the biggest buzz? I think Chris nailed it before. I, look, I love the adrenaline rush of newspapers, particularly at the old Herald, which a lot of you will remember, the broadsheet afternoon paper uh, that uh, the Herald and Weekly Times produced. When you can turn a story around from sort of getting a, a phone call at 8 or 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning and having that story in print two hours later, I mean, that is a massive buzz. But over an extended period, I think open mic was the thing that satisfied me most. I love getting into the, the people. I th our view was that everyone has a story to tell. And I think if, if you do your homework and you find out about what makes them tick and what's happened in their life, and you can get in front of them and, and lead them to sort of talk about that, I think that's a major achievement. And I watched, um, this will sound weird, someone watching themselves on telly, and it was a replay anyway. I watched Jason Ackermanis this week, and oddly enough, we didn't show any of Ackermanis' highlights, and his highlights package is brilliant. So we made a mistake there, but the, the discussion about his private life and personal life and, and the problems on the way through, it fascinated me. I mean, I was watching it like I wasn't involved. It was just sort of some bloke with my name who was talking to him and him owning up about how disruptive he'd been, uh, how much trouble he'd caused, all the trauma in his family on the way through. And I loved it. I just wish it had gone on for another 15 minutes. So doing that is so good because it's just really me and him, the, the, the subject and me just talking about their story and me trying to make it as interesting as I can. Let's go there. Let's go open mic. We're there, Kate. <laughs> Let's dig deeper. Um, I'm going to throw a few names or subjects, subject matters along the way. Um, I'm going to go with Alan Stoneham. Yeah. I remember sitting there watching the show and, and I, I, Alan, I knew and got to know and I just sat there crying. Yeah. Yeah, we, um, uh, Alan Stoneham played played at Footscray at 16 years of age when, when football was like walking the streets Saturday night. It was rough and there were king hits and people belted everyone up um, in, the, in the 80s. He went to Essendon. Uh, good, nice man. He was so good as a kid that the Bulldogs gave him Ted Witten's number three Guernsey. Um, more recently, his son, uh, who was schizophrenic, um, no, it's difficult for me to even recount this now. Um, murdered his girlfriend. Stabbed her in the neck. Killed her. Um, and he talked about that. We talked about it. Just the, the impact on your life. He was out for dinner and he got a phone call. And suddenly this, the boy he loves and still loves had killed the daughter of their very, very good family friends who he hasn't spoken to since. Um, I'm just thinking the impact on people's lives of stuff like that. And his, to him, my view is his eternal credit to him in being able to speak about that. And I don't know if it saves anyone else's life, but I think to sort of lay yourself bare like he did and like Peter Swab did when he talked about losing his five-year-old daughter to a brain tumour. And people, I think, I'm sure some people think that I'm intrusive and go too far, but... I think that's that's life. I mean, this is what we're talking about. Rather than dropping a mark or missing a goal, this is this is real life. And you know, Stoneham had tears, and Peter Swab did, and I don't know what, what that says about me. But there were so many people that we had that uh, were talking about death for their children, and um, and these big tough guys crying on television. Um, but but I mean, in a professional sense. I love that because it was touching a nerve. It was getting to their soul. Um, so um, the stone of mine is still, I mean, even now, it still makes me um, emotional. 
Um, me too, clearly. Um, Brian Lake's an interesting one. We recently spoke about, he must have been on, on the, the countdown of the best open mics. And it was uh, it was quite confronting. Yeah, his reaction, his his breakdown on 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 television. You said to me, "I'm not sure I should have done that." Yeah, yeah. I think I think Brian Lake. For those of you who aren't familiar with him, he played at the Bulldogs, went to Hawthorne, and played in three premierships in a row and won a Norm Smith medal. And I got him at a vulnerable time. When I say I got him, it wasn't a setup, but he agreed to come on. And I said, "Look, bring your manager." who was a bloke called Marty Pask, who played a few games for the Bulldogs, as comfort. But he sort of, he sobbed his way through the last 15 minutes. And I remember, I didn't know him all that well. And I'm sitting in my chair and I've got a couple of wires on me for being able to talk to the control room and listen. And I wanted to get up and I wanted to hug him as we finished on television. And I wasn't sure how he would react to that. So I didn't do it, but I just wish I had it. I mean, I'm big on look, men showing their emotions and, and their, their sympathy for people. But he was he was a broken man. He just, um, his marriage had broken down, all the things that came with that. He was addressing life without football in it. Um, and, you know, that was that was powerful. But I think he was probably too vulnerable to go on television, I think. Um, on that topic, we often talk about, and Dad would get frustrated when someone would say no to him and they would... They wouldn't be saying no because they didn't like him and they didn't necessarily um, dislike the show. But I remember years and years and years ago, we talk about the fact that there are people that don't want to go there. Can you tell us some of the people that, yeah, that yeah. said no and, and even some of your really good friends in football? Yeah, the case in point, Gary Lyon. I mean, I'm, I'm good friends with Gary. I sat next to him at a Melbourne footy club function in about 1986 when he got his first jumper. 16-year-old shy boy, shy Gary Lyon uh, from Shepparton. Uh, and I've worked with him on, on radio and TV since then. And I like him, um, but he won't come on. And I know why, because he doesn't want to talk about it. He knows that I would have to ask him about the marriage breakdown and Billy Brownless and what that meant. So he just says no. Tim Watson says no. Um, I think it's because of Job. And I think he, he, he believes that Job was victimised, was wrongly denied his Brownlow medal. And Tim's not quite sure what he would say if he came on. So Jared Healy won't come on. Jared and, and I worked with him for years. And typically, Jared, when I said to Jared finally, I said, "Come on," he said, "No." He said, "I ask questions. I don't answer them." I thought, "Well, <laughs> right, Jared, that'll be the last time I ask you." Um, Bernie Quinlan. Bernie Quinlan won't do it. But there's a Bernie Quinlan is genuinely a good friend of mine. Was a great friend of Robbie Flowers, um, and and Bernie says no he says no i don't want any publicity but bernie lost his daughter at 19 from ovarian cancer oh, do you like, um i don't know why i go down this path um and he just won't do it and i and i, I know look it'd be, be like losing you you know i just you couldn't con contemplate talking about it I always said, well, I always said to Dad that the, the you know, cheers, I was a football. He loves the ratings. And I always said, cheers, get the ratings. So uh, that was my tact in this little... Um, yeah, they do. And the other one that... that I, I, look, I hope I'm not taking someone's thunder in questions, but the other one that gets talked about most is the Mark Jackson one, which was really confronting. And I mean, some people... I remember Stephen Quartermain said on television, oh, that was a setup, you know, uh, just to pump Jacko's tyres up and to improve the ratings of the show. I had no idea... But Jackson was going to be the pig he was. I mean, he, he said he hoped I got cancer. Um, he said he called me a pubic hair. Uh, oh, there were all these different, oh, but no one like no one. He said, no one likes you in football. All these different things over a half an hour period. Um, and then when it finished, Fox said to me, he said, we won't run that. He said, that, that, they said, that's rubbish. We're not going to let that lunatic have his way. And I said, no, we have to run it. We can't invite people on then sort of only run them if they tell us the answers that we want to hear. So uh, I said it needs to be run in total, not edited at all, um, and people can make their own mind up. And mercifully, I got 180 messages, uh, text messages in the following days from that, from people like Wayne Carey and Michael Voss and Dennis Banks and all these footballers, tough guy footballers, who just thought that he was just so out of, um, so rude and just so crass that... Um, 
that they sort of uh, they needed to support me, which was very which was very comforting actually. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely believe that's what came out of it. You realised you weren't disliked, and in <laughs> fact, he was disliked. Mm. Um, I'm going to go. I'm going to I'm going to throw a bunch of names at you. Yep, and yeah. you need to give me bunches of yeah bananas coming bunches. This not happens notes. every day. He just critiques <laughs> the way I speak, write everything. We're talking to <laughs> academia here. We can't. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to say a person's name and you need to give me one word answer. Right. Uh, Dacos. Uh, difficult. Locket. <sighs> Scary. Merit. A deal. That's what? Roger. That's the Essendon bloke, Roger, who nearly throttled me to death in Cape Town one time. Well, I, I, we're going to go two more and then you're going to tell that story. Um, Mick Moldhouse. Um, crusty. I'm going to go back to the Roger Merritt story. So let's set the scene. It's, I want to say it's 1997. You're with the, you're in Cape Town. Yep. And the Brisbane Bears at the time hadn't turned into the Lions yet. Yep. Are playing an exhibition game against Fremantle. Yep. It was a pre, pre-season cup, whatever yep. that was called then. Yeah. And you're there on a, essentially a junket, right? To cover the game. No. Good junkets. <laughs> Tell us what happened at the bar that night. It wasn't at the bar. It was dinner. Dinner. I was having dinner with, uh, I think, certainly Scott Clayton was there, Dipper. Andrew Ireland. Andrew Ireland. Uh, John Northey, I think. was. Anyway, Roger, we, we see Roger. We're in Cape Town, we're up market, on the, on the water, beautiful place, um, high class. We see Roger Merritt walking back from wherever he'd been. And he was walking. He was a bit wobbly like he'd uh, done a knee or had too much to drink. You can make your own mind up about that. Uh, and he came in and started talking and things as they do with all these different things. And I could tell Merritt despised the media and always had. And and the, the most recent cause for that was that um, he'd been labelled the hit man. Some of you will remember that, that uh, there was a story on the back page of The Sun saying there was a hit man playing in football. Um, that was done, I think, by Darren Hinch, and then Ron Barassi named Merritt. So anyway, so this led to the tirade about the media and, um, uh, you know, what bums they parasites and all that. This is, this is Merritt talking. And he, he kept going about this sort of stuff. And I said at one point, I said, hey, Roger, it's not your game. I said, I love it just as much as you do. You just played it better than I did. To which he got up and launched across the table and put put these massive hands like Stewie Lowe's hands around my neck <laughs> and I thought I'm going to die here in South Africa and uh, and mercifully Scotty Clayton and um, Dipper uh, you know peeled him off and and told him to go to bed which he did but um, that was that's probably the only physical altercation there's certainly been plenty of verbal altercations because it's difficult when when someone like me and Caroline Wilson's another and Mark Robinson we express opinions and they're strong opinions. They're usually negative opinions because we're talking about what's gone wrong with people in their playing careers or their coaching careers. So they're angry about it and it ferments. And then when you cross paths with them unexpectedly, often it spills over as it did in South Africa. I'm going to go to the, to the journos and the, and the chief football writers and I'm going to give you four names and I'm going to get you to rank them. In sorry, order- sorry before, I'll do that. There'll be plenty of Collingwood supporters in this group. I just want to explain about Peter Dacos. What people like me do when I was working in newspapers and what Wilson and Robinson and co do, we have a view about people personally, but we have a view about them professionally, which is the most important thing. And I, I, I love Dacos as a footballer. He was a brilliant player. But I wrote some stories that he didn't like. And the regret about that is that he, this is, 40 years on, he still hasn't moved on. And that's the part of my, I can understand people being upset and say, I want to talk to you or you, I thought you were a prick at that time or whatever, but it's no good for him. It, it's no good for people to be carrying this, this um, chip on their shoulders so long afterwards. And he, he won't even talk to me. I asked him to come on open mic by text message several times. He didn't even bother to answer. And it's just, it's a bad example. He's got two boys coming to football now. I think it's a really bad example to set for them. He doesn't have to like me, but he's got to be able to say, this is the world we live in. Yep. Um, all right, we're going to go to the, the journals. If you want me to rate them. I'm going to give you four names. Yeah. Caroline Wilson, Mark Robinson, 
Damien Barrett, and Patrick Smith. And you need to rank them in order. <laughs> yeah. And why? And you need to give it a why. I'm not coming on your show anymore, Kay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm a... I'm in the minority here, but I'm a Robinson fan. He was, and it's not unfair to say he was a, a protege of mine. He's 20 years younger than I am. Um, he came down from Bendigo when I was at the Herald Sun and, and, and I nurtured him, I think. I think I've always had Jen Bramwell's in the, in the part of your audience. And I think she would agree that I've always been open to kids and, and sort of help them as much as I can. Uh, so I was warm to Robbo and gave him plenty of, tips and took him introduced him to lots of important people i like him i mean he's, he's got rough edges um but he's i think he's good at his job he's ballsy um he understands football played in the bendigo league which is a pretty good testing ground so um i've no issue with robo wilson's good i've always said if i was starting a, a paper from scratch in melbourne and we got to the sports section uh i'd say she would be the first person i'd hire I mean, she's got, she's very, very tough. Um, and then she's got that, um, don't take offence here, women. She's got, she's beguiling when she needs to be. I mean, she has a nickname of the perfume steamroller because she can just crush people. And she's got this great capacity to win them back. And she's done that for years. So I worked with her when she was young. She was 17 when we first, um, we joined forces in at the Herald. So I know her really well. Uh, who are the other two? Smith and Barrett. Patrick Smith was a brilliant writer, but he was a bit like Peter Dacos. He had a chip on his shoulder. He didn't like people. I don't know how you can work in journalism and not like people, um, but but outstanding writer. Um, Damien Barrett, I find him difficult to, to classify. Uh, well, you mean as a bloke or as a journo? As a journo. Well, I, I worked with him at the, at the, uh, the Herald Sun. He's good. He's um, Channel 9, love him. Uh, and he's now the chief, some would say chief propagandist for the Herald, for the AFL, but he now leads their media section. So, look, if you've been senior and successful over a long period, I think that speaks for itself. Yeah, I would have thought so. Um, last night you were on AFL 360. I was. And I'm watching from the couch and you start talking about Mark Robinson. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, no, no, you can't go there. And you went there. No one has spoken. Mark Robinson is not currently on AFL 360, and Dad just went there. Well, I'll, I'll explain it to you this way. Now, we're all consumers, all of us. However many here today, we're all consumers. My view is reporters are purveyors of news. For seven weeks, for some obscure reason, no one has told anyone in the world that Mark Robinson had open heart surgery. It just disappeared. And I cannot understand why... Fox and the Herald Sun of 3AW would allow that to continue. And I didn't deliberately go on there last night to blow the cover, but someone asked me about Robbo and I told the story. I said, he, he said, major surgery, he had open heart surgery, and I've spoken to him several times and he's going along slowly, but I can't understand it. I, I, and David King um, sent me a note afterwards. He says, good on you. He said, that's what we're about. We're about people telling people things they're interested in that they don't know. So I had no issue with that. If Fox rang me today and said, you shouldn't have done that, I said, well, I'm a, new, I'm a reporter. I mean, that's what we do. We find out things that are of interest and we tell the public. So I have no issue with all with that. Um, Rob is a good friend of yours, but you, along the way, you have formed really beautiful friendships with, with lots of people, players, administrators, um, journos. I want you to talk about, and I feel it's fitting, um, the great and don't beautiful, ask me about Robert Flower. Beautiful Robert Flower. Oh, uh, and I want, but I want to take it back, and I want you to talk about a car ride on the way to a golf game after you've had a check up yourself. Oh yeah, that's yes. Well, sadly, um, Bobby is gone, but this was to do with um, with uh, prostate cancer, um, and I and I'm. Become, I've become very responsible about skin and, and you know, health issues that, that blokes have as they get older. And I talked him into, I, I badgered him into going to see a urologist about his prostate and he had prostate cancer. But, but, but to set the scene at the time, they're driving to a golf game and we don't know that Robbie's sick. We don't know that he's got prostate cancer. 
Dad's just saying, I've just had a checkup. You just go and get a checkup. It could save your life. Yeah. So, so Robbie goes on the Monday to have a checkup and they find he's got prostate cancer. So he rang me. He rang me. He said, you saved my life. And I'd forgotten even about the chat at that stage. And it transpired that that's what had happened. Um, yeah, look, it's, it's hard to talk about. It, it's a tragic loss. Everyone who dies young is a tragic loss. I understand that. But Flower is the best person that I've met in football through football. I mean, we all loved him. Chris, every Melbourne, I mean, supporters of every club, Robbie Flower, loved Robbie Flower. But he was a brilliant person. I remember we, I lived in Burwood. Um, this is 20 odd years ago. And I was playing in a Tuesday night tennis competition. You know, just a suburb, scrubbers, blokes running around and pretending they're good players uh, and playing tennis. And I, I asked Tulip if he'd like to play. He said, I'll play. So uh, he turns up and plays. Not only does he turn up and play, he turns up and he brings plates of sandwiches. <laughs> and then as soon as we finish the tennis, he grabs the bag and he's bagging the onto car courts and he goes inside and he makes tea. You know, people are saying... This can't, be, this can't be a famous league footballer doing this stuff. Most of them sit there and want to be pampered and don't expect to do anything other than what they choose to do. And Flower was so different to that. And I mean, Kate Newing, I think there are special people that come along that lots of us know in different spheres of our lives, but he was one of them. He's just a beautiful man, Robert Flower. How do you think that the impact of his of his death at such a young age had on the footy club and, and those around him, whether it be oh. his brother... Or, yeah. or, or Bernie Quinlan or these types. Like there's a bit of a, a group of, of these guys like Tom, his brother, and Bernie yeah. Quinlan and dad, and, and they go and they go down to Sereno and they they have, you know, get on the beers. And when you lose that link, how does it feel? Well, I, I, I feel for him. I mean, just he was he was a boy from Murrumbina, I'm just fairly modest upbringing. I'm talking to, in economic terms. Um just had done everything he needed to do. It was it, it had a great career. Um, it had uh, he had his kids. He had money. Everything, and and then it just and he was chopped down. I mean, just uh, and the way he died, the death was terrible. He, he had um, when he had his heart done, and I've had this done. So I'm talking from I've, I've been opened up and had that done. My valve, new valve, was organic. So, but he had a metal. Um, I don't know what they're called, but anyway. Stint. No, it wasn't a stent. It was, it was a, whatever he needed replacing was replaced by a metallic object. Um, and when you've got infection in your body, um, all the, the bad stuff is drawn straight to this foreign body. foreign body. And he was at Sorrento and he'd been to a dentist. And now I know when you go to a dentist, I've got to take um, uh, anti. What are, Anti-inflammatories? No. What, what, um, Bodies. Anti antibiotics. Uh, anti no. What, <laughs> He's got to take medicine. Whatever they are, <laughs> tablets before I go to the dentist because he uses that metal thing to go in and clean your teeth. Um, and that didn't happen with Tulip. And he was at Sereno by himself and he got an infection and it just took over his body. And when he finally got back to Melbourne, he was just consumed by it and they couldn't save him. He went to Epworth and he was just his sister just broke down and he died. I'm thinking, you know, just you shouldn't lose people like that and you shouldn't lose good people. But anyway, everyone does. I know that, um, that you know, it just happens. That's just life, sadly. Um, How are we going, Kate? Yeah, I've, I've just realised we've probably gone too long. So um, I, I hope you've enjoyed my line of questioning. Um, I went a bit deep, I, but it's grand final week and we're all emotional. You know, you, haven't, you, know what you haven't asked me? What? We, when everyone else, are, why don't you ask me who's the best player I've seen is? Ah, who's the best player you've seen? Good question, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wayne Carey is the best player that I've seen. I'm in the minority. I think I'm not necessarily a minority. I think most people, the majority would say Lee Matthews, and Lee Matthews' record is unbelievably good. Um, but Carey, to me, and I always use this sort of uh, analogy, that Carey, to me, is like, being back at primary school and the kid from grade six coming down and playing with the kids from grade two. Um, and he just can do what he likes and he kicks the ball further and he marks higher and he's tougher and all those sort of things. So uh, I've got Kerry at one and Matthews at two and Gary Ablett Senior at three. I'm going to stop you there because in today's day and age, it's not just AFL. We play, the girls play footy these days. They do. Who's your best AFLW player? 
Um, she's a good question, Kate. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know her. <laughs> I uh, oh, look. I used to think it was a, a tie between Brennan and Conti, um, but there's a couple emerging at Richmond, and I picked one of those for you, Kate. This girl here, Harriet Cordner. I saw her play for Melbourne, and had the Cordner hands, brilliant over her head. Not quite as efficient from hand to foot, but I thought they attack the footy uh, with you know the gusto that you want. And I thought she's a star. So um, uh, when you pair it all away, I'd say Ellie McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> all right, enough from the Sheehan's. Over to the question time. Okay, Kate, that was awesome. And Mike, of course, that was awesome. So thank you. We'll see if anyone from the audience can um, have a similar line of questioning. Uh, Rob Stewart, you've got a, a couple there, one on the Templeton Moore story and then one on, on whether the uh, journos have a, a role in breaking stories. Yeah, thanks, uh, Scotty. As a, as a Bulldog supporter, I, first of all, I must say I'm looking forward very much to Saturday week. Um, so two questions for you, Mike. Um, Firstly, how did, just as an example, how did you find out about the moves of Templeton and Moore and how do you conform, confirm your sources for these sorts of stories before you run them? And then the second one is, how often do you think the journos start the whole thing with moves to sack the coach? It seems like those sort of stories just underpin their ratings and they can't wait to get them started. So they almost start them when there's nothing in them whatsoever. Uh yeah, it's a good question, but I'm not sure that there's ever nothing in them. I don't think, I think we like to say that we, are, we convey the message rather than create the message. Um, I, I'm not sure, let's give, there's plenty of examples currently of coaches like Chris Scott's situation. Now, I don't know. Um, <laughs> can sorry. We, sorry, can we take, take me out, Lizzie, it, please? It's my two year old. I apologize. <laughs> Just to um, I'm not sure that the um, I think the Chris Scott situation is, is interesting in, in terms of there was no nothing to link him with Carlton until the weekend and then suddenly someone decided well there's a vacancy at Carlton uh, there's a possibility that Scott's run his race at Geelong and, and drew the link now that's probably not necessarily creation but it's 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 creative um, the more intimidating situation. I, you'll think this is uh, convenient. I actually can't remember. I know though that there was one person at Melbourne who was uh, in a high office who um, was encouraging me to go down that path. And I had probably him, um, Jeff Brown, who's uh, angling for the Collingwood presidency. He was, um, he was involved in that in a legal context. Uh, there were probably three or four and I think in the end, it's just you get all these pieces and then they sort of come together and suddenly you've got, in the finish, you've got a product. And, and that's, and then not, not, people always say, whenever I talk to journalism students, I say, if in doubt, leave it out. But in these cases, there's very, very, very few occasions when we go to print 100% sure that it's right. Um, probably we shouldn't, but, but if you don't, you get done. So that's the balancing act. And I think the other part of that question, Mike, was just the um, the confirming sources with... Um... Yeah, well, that's back and forth. You know, there would be, say, in the more Templeton situation, there would have been three or four people that were relevant to that and that, were, that knew what was going on. Maybe not even, not, certainly not four, maybe three. And it's just, again, it's just sort of reinforcing the point with them or going back and sort of saying, well, what about this? Uh, or someone says this. And you just get there by um, by dint of sort of exhaustion in the finish. You just ask that many questions of the people who should know, and then come to hopefully a considered conclusion. Fantastic. So now, look, I have another question here. Or uh, uh, Jamie Gorton, you had a, a question. You're on mute, mate. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Thanks, but I'm just curious. In, you know, in recent years, there's been a lot of talk about the way racism has been called out in the AFL. Was that something that 
do you think was ignored for a long time or just was not something that anyone discussed or talked about? I'm mm -hmm. interested to know whether it was a matter that everybody knew about but nobody talked about or it really just wasn't thought through. No, I think you're right. I think I know Gary Lyon's a good example of this. Gary Lyon racially abused Chris Lewis in a game um, and as blunt as you could be. In fact, it was very similar to what Tex Walker said more recently. Gary's apologised to Lewis and apologised publicly and said that's just a part of an education process. But he, Gary Lyon, people spoke like Gary. Gary's very got an acid tongue on the football field. Um, and he was, most of them were like that in those days. I mean, they said some terrible things, but that was because it was seen to be acceptable. And because the Indigenous players or, or the people from non-Australian backgrounds, they just live with it because that went with the territory. And then they decided, well, they weren't going to. So they've kicked up about it. And I think we've got better and better by the year. Very good. And the Walker one, the, the Walker one is interesting because I'll admit to this, and I'm not necessarily all that proud of it. When I heard what happened with Walker, and I was watching Caroline Wilson on Footy Classified, and she said, he may never play again. He should be rubbed out. I think she said for six weeks, or, and, or maybe they shouldn't even go on with him, right? And I'm thinking, this is early, first, second, first or second day. I'm thinking, geez, a bit of an overreaction, that is, no? You know, and, and I knew what he said. I mean, and it wasn't particularly imaginative. He just said, why don't you whack the black um, expletive? So I'm thinking, would, you, would your career hang on that? But then as it, and, and this is the part of the education process, going back to the question, I'm better educated now. I'm not racist about I mean, I think you should nev never say that, but I didn't think it warranted the fallout that it did, but I'm glad it's had it. And I think that's just uh, fast track the education process. Mm. And, and look, he, he, I've got seriously, I, I would, I've got serious doubts about whether Walker will play at Adelaide again. And I think I feel for him a bit from that. Shouldn't have said it. Lots of people have. It became public because they're now more prepared to take it on and make an issue of it. But I think his career should stand for more than that. And I'm not sure it will in the finish. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, I, apologies to everybody. I've got so many questions here, so I'm not going to get to everybody's. But there is one that I'll pick out purely because you were colleagues at the paper. Uh, Jen Bramwell, did you want to ask your question to Mike? Hi, Mike. Hi, Kate. Hi, Jen. Um, <laughs> I um, I was interested that you said that you're really big on guys opening up and showing emotion. Um, and I'm wondering whether you think the media helps or hinders in that area. Um, you know, there's been some high profile casualties of, of um, some of your colleagues, even with mental health issues. And um, yeah, I'm just interested whether or not you think um, the job that we do um, is helpful or, or perhaps contributes. Um. You mean the, the way we the way we critically review people? Yeah, I mean the uh, pressure of a press conference yeah. post match. You know, putting I don't know we have stakeouts outside some people's yeah, I know you know, that, I don't like that. houses, all those sorts of things, and it's all in the quest to tell the story. But do we go too far sometimes? Of course we do, and we we always have. That's not a modern phenomenon. We we did that in my day, your day, the current time. Um, I think. The case in point is Adam Trelaw. Adam Trelaw has got a known, do documented case of um, mental, uh, you know, questionable mental health. Uh, I mean, he's a nice boy, Adam, but he's got this issue that he's prepared to talk about and more power to him. But he got smashed last week on one poor game of football. And, and, and blokes who I um, respect as commentators just seem to go after him. And I think that's to your point. I mean, do we, do we have to say we can't be as critical of this bloke as we might be because he's got a history of um, mental health issues or do we just sort of say, well, we have to put that to one side. I'll give you a real example of this. Um, Majak Dor, and everyone knows what happened with Majak. Majak Dor smashed Mason Cox across the throat in a VFL game a month ago and cracked his larynx and nothing came, it's on television and it was off the ball and nothing came of it. And, and my own view is that they sort of said, well, Magic's history and it's too hard uh, and we better leave it alone. So I'm, I can't abide that. I can't, if, if Magic's out there playing football, he's got to be subject to the same laws as everyone else. 
but you don't know what the impact of that's going to be. And I think your point about the stakeouts, I don't like that. I mean, suddenly we're turning people who have never had any publicity at all or never had anything to do with the media, they're like fugitives. And I, I think we need to be more careful on that. Fabulous. Mike, Kate, this has been wonderful. Just a, a closing remark, Ken, I think you'd like to, to the warden of Trinity College, Professor Ken Hinchcliffe. Yeah, thanks, Scotty. Um, and it's uh, it's just I, I said before we were on uh, on air that just how wonderful this morning is, and it's one of the best mornings of the year in the college. This is this is just remarkable. And you know, we heard from uh, Mike and Kate this morning, and it's following on from you know Tim Lane, Kevin Sheedy, uh, Jeffrey Blaney last year, um, Martin Flanagan the year before, and we've just had this been so fortunate to have such wonderful speakers year after year after year. And, and Kate and Mike, um, you've not, uh, not changed that trajectory at all. This has been just absolutely amazing. You know, Jeffrey Blaney spoke about uh, footy in the 1860s and 1870s, and Martin Flanagan told us about Tom Wills. And uh, actually, it, it prompted me to take a trip to Moyston to see where the in Jabwaran country where uh, Australian rules football actually began, according to some people. Um, so these have been remarkable, uh, remarkable um, events each morning uh, for the last few years, for the last seven or eight years. And today we got a much more contemporary view of football, uh, a football of the last 30 or 40 years and with the insight of someone who's looked at it and watched it very, very closely. So, Mike, thank you. Uh, Kate, you ask questions that only a daughter could ask of her father. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and that's been very brave. Can you see any, you see any this, uh, coming uh, two week, in a week and a half's time? Uh, some of you I know are going to be at the game. Uh, most of us will be watching it. I hope it's not a repeat of what happened on last Friday and last Saturday nights in a 51 point margin or something like that. I want it to be a one point margin, maybe not with uh, Gorm kicking the goal, the winning <laughs> goal after the siren. But uh, anyway, we're looking forward to a great match. Um, you know, 1954 to now, it's a long time. I'm just so excited about it. And this has been a wonderful morning. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, Trinity's delighted to be able to host this. And we're absolutely um, privileged to have the Cordner family uh, allow us to do this year after year. And Chris, you're, you've become more eloquent, if that's possible, year after year. I, I remember clearly the 2018 when you were recounting the 1948 grand final story. Uh, that was 70, something, 70 odd years on. It was just remarkable. So uh, this is a fixture in our calendar. It's one of the best mornings of the year. Scotty, Viv, Judith, thanks so much for organising this. It's wonderful. And thank you all for attending. And uh, enjoy the game and, um, you know, go doggies. <laughs> no. <laughs> thank you very much, Mike and Kate. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Tilda, thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy Hope the your team time. wins, Chris. Thanks very much, Mike. Thank you, Kate. It was terrific. Thank thanks you. Very you. grateful to you. Go days. <laughs> <laughs>